friends and family from afar on the live stream. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. I'm um, excited to be together with you because this is a wonderful day that God has made and his grace has been lavished upon us to have life and life anew through his son Jesus. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's a reason to sing even where you're at today inside your home. And uh, as we do, uh, every time we gather, we like to start off our time with a call to worship to center our, our minds, our hearts, our souls more fully on Christ, who is wonderful and beautiful. So uh, I want to do that today. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God even cares, to all who are weak and fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior, to all who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and to whoever will come. This church opens wide her doors and offers welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, let's sing together today. One, two, three, four. <laughs> not fail and he is good be reminded today a rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow of sin, the double cure. Save from wrath, save from wrath, and make me pure. And He does wash me, Savior, or I die. Wash. Come to thee for dress 
helpless Lord to the full grace found light to thy fountain fly wash me say Remind us of your grace today, oh God. Family, we're going to move into a time of, of confession. We want to do this together today. Our confession comes to us from 1 John uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 9. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And that's the thought by what we're doing here. On the other side of the screens today, young and old, kids, if you're in the room with your parents, um, here's how we're gonna do this today. I'm gonna start um, the confession, and then I'm gonna have you guys join me um, in a moment. So on the screen, it's gonna say leader. I'm gonna read that part. And then when it says people, where you're at at home, I just want you to join with me and recite that last part of the confession. We'll do this together today. Father God, we confess that we have done things that you say we shouldn't do. We have not loved you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors like you say we should in your mercy. I'll have you join me now. Forgive what we have done. Help us be more like you. Help us love your ways and walk in your love, being more like Jesus. Amen. Family, our assurance today comes from Psalm 103, verses 11 through 12. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. That is our faithful God always loving us, always showering us with grace that we don't deserve. So let's sing about his faithfulness today. Let's continue singing.
not love. I could not love thee so blind. Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see, and all I have needed. Father, you are worthy of all praise. I thank you, Father, for the mercies that you have poured out on us this morning, this gift of life, physical life within our frames, the spiritual life you have given to us because of your Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, would you be honored here this morning? Lord Jesus, would you be praised? Would you be glorified in your people? Father, I confess this morning, I grieve that we are not yet gathered together, that we are not here taking communion with each other in our sorrows and our joys. And I celebrate you. And I take great joy in your gospel that you would save a sinful people and you would call us your kids. You would make us yours. So Heavenly Father, this day as, as we open up your word, would we participate in the ministry that you are doing through your son, Jesus Christ? Would you open up our hearts? Would you soften them? Would you sharpen our minds? Would you make us more loving, would you make us ultimately like our Savior, Jesus Christ? We love you. We deeply need you. Would you teach us this morning 
the way of lament and would you empower these words by your spirit that you might be honored and that my brothers and sisters might taste of your life. It is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Well, welcome family and friends. It's my honor and privilege today to um, take us again into uh, the scriptures, and it's going to be a little bit of a a bumpy ride this morning as we are landing in Lamentations chapter 2. So uh, to launch us into this, first a question, have you ever been angry? Have you ever looked out on the world around us and seen something that has grieved you, that has lit the fuse of anger within you? Now, I I know that's an absurd question, right? Of course, (laughs) of course. But has that anger ever been righteous? Has it ever been a good and actually a beautiful thing, a healthy thing? Has it ever been unrighteous, a bent Thing, a broken thing, a selfish thing. Can anger ever be good? Anger is actually a part of lament, and it's important for us to acknowledge this, I, I think. Sadness and anger are often intertwined at the deepest of levels, their roots. They, they run together, and, and if I were to take a guess, I would guess that we have many things to lament in this season of life that we are in, but I would also guess that many of us have experienced anger as we look upon the social unrest within our nation, as we uh, experience the ramifications of COVID-19, as we live in lockdown, as we see protests and and riots and, and corruption, as we see all of these things. I know there's anger in so many of us. And so today, we're going to look at anger, we're going to look at justice, we're going to look at mercy, and we're going to look at lament and ask that God would open our eyes as we do. So let's pick up from last week. Uh, Last week, we saw that the curtain rose uh, on the dimly lit and smoldering stage of the book of Lamentations. And there we saw the city of Jerusalem destroyed in 587 B.C., And onto this stage walks the poet narrator telling us of this sad, sad story of what happened to God's city and God's people. And then the spotlight moves and it lands on a weeping woman. And this weeping woman, she is the daughter of Zion, the city of Jerusalem personified and she speaks in first person about her ruin she shares her her sorrow with us and so last week we launched into the way of lament lament a language that is foreign for much of the western world and much of the western church and and the reality is if we're going to be healthy apprentices of Jesus we need to walk the way of lament we need to acknowledge the ruin and the reality of the hurt around us, and we need to turn to God for redemption, for restoration of all things. And so before we go into our text here, let me just define lament as we talked about it last week. Remember, lament is prayer that spills from wounds. It is trust seen through the ravages of of trauma. It is pain turned into prayer as an act of trust in a faithful God. Lament is pain turned into prayer as an act of trust in a faithful God. And so that's what we're going to look at today, this this trust in a faithful God. But the question smolders before us, how? How and, and why? If God is a faithful God, then why in the world was Jerusalem so radically destroyed and the people coming to, to ruin in, in the way that we see in the book of Lamentations? How is this possible? And if you recall... Uh, the, the very first word of the book of Lamentations in Hebrew is, is echa, which means how. How in the world is this possible? And that word shows up again here at the start of chapter 2 today, echa. How? How has this happened? 
And so we're going to read chapter 2. Now, as we do, I just want to let you know, we're going to read the entirety of chapter 2. And uh, it's going to be rough. There, there's some really raw, painful, unsettling things in here. But I, I ask that you would actively listen and that the majority of what God would do this morning by his spirit would, would come through the reading of his holy word. So, and to Lamenta- Lamentations chapter 2. Here's the word of the Lord. How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the habitations of Jacob. In his wrath, he has broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn from them his right hand in the face of the enemy. He is burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. He has bent his bow like an enemy with his right hand set like a foe. And he has killed all who were delightful in our eyes. In the tent of the daughter of Zion, he has poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He has laid in ruins its strongholds. And he has multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. He has laid waste his booth like a garden, laid it in ruins, his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. The Lord has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. He has delivered into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They raised the clamor in the house of the Lord as on the day of festival. The Lord had determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion. He stretched out the measuring line. He did not restrain his hand from destroying. He caused rampart and wall to lament. They languished together. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He has ruined and broken her bars. Her king and princesses are among the nations. The law is no more, and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. silence. They have thrown dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. They cry to their mothers, where is bread and wine as they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city? As their life is poured out on their mother's bosom, What can I say for you? To to what compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may comfort you? O virgin daughter of Zion, for your ruin is vast as the sea. Who can heal you? Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. All who pass along the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and they wag their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth? All your enemies rail against you. They hiss, they gnash their teeth, they cry. We have swallowed her. Ah, this is the day we long for. Now we have it and we see it. The Lord has done what he purposed. He has carried out his word, which he commanded a long ago. He has thrown down without pity. He has made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. Their heart cried to the Lord, O wall 
of the daughter of Zion. Let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. Arise, cry out in the night. At the beginning of the night watches, pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Look, look, O Lord, and see with whom have you dealt thus. Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. You summoned, as if to a festival day, my terrors on every side. And on the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived. Those whom I held and raised, my enemy destroyed. There is no question, when you read this, that it is God that has done this. Now, That is a hard statement to hear, to say, and more so to to believe. So how how could God not only allow something so awful as we just read, but actually how can it be attributed to him? How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. If you go through this, these are the kind of words that you hear over and over again. He has, he has, he has, the Lord has. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has laid in ruins his strongholds. He has bent his bow. He has cut down in fierce anger the mighty men. God has done this thing. Now, how? How do we deal with that? How do we reckon these statements with a good God? Well, there's a key verse in here that helps us a great deal, and it is verse 17. Uh, This is a hyperlink verse. This is a verse that pushes the zoom out button and and says, all right, now you need to look at the bigger story here. It's a verse that calls us to remember something. And here's the verse that I'm speaking of. Verse 17, here's what it says. The Lord has done what he purposed. He has carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. He has thrown down without pity. He has made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. Okay, so what what in the world does this mean? That the Lord has done what he has purposed. That he is carrying out his word. So again, this is where we need to zoom out and see Lamentations in light of the whole story, the the, the arc of redemption that runs from Genesis to Revelation. And here's the deal. When reading scripture, we always need to see the story that we're in in light of the greater story. And if we don't do that, we end up misreading who God is. And so here in verse 17, it leads us back to an incredible verse that we've talked a lot about, um, but we need to get it deep in our bones. So back to Exodus 34, we go for just a minute. And here, at this point in in the story, God has graciously, um, divinely self-disclosed himself to Moses. He says, this is what I am like. And here's what he says, Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. In short, God is perfectly just. God is perfectly merciful and compassionate. He in his perfections is both. He is not trigger happy and he is not apathetic. This is good news. We want justice. We want a God who is just. We want mercy. We want a God who is merciful because we need it because we ourselves do evil. 
And it is carved into the very architecture of our hearts, this, this cry for justice, right? Just, just look out at the, at the protests, at the signs, the speeches, the, the tweets, the, the memes, the calls for action that flood our media. And you see examples of this desire for justice. When a corrupt judge lets a murderer off the hook, what do we cry out? It's not right. It's unjust. We, we need justice. When someone has abused somebody and, and their wealth and their influence gets them off the hook, we cry out. This, this righteous indignation rises in us and we go, it's not right. It's not right that this is happening. When, when racism shows its evil ways, and hurts those who are image bearers, right? We, we have this cry for us that rises up. It's, it's not just. Justice needs to be seen. In anger against that which is wrong, that which is hurtful, that which is destructive, it, it wells up within the human soul. And do you know why? It's because we're made in the image of this God who is perfectly just, who is perfectly merciful, and in chapter 2 of Lamentations, we see the judgment of this just God, and we hear the word anger. So how do we understand this? Um, again, let's, let's look at Scripture in light of Scripture. So let's turn to Deuteronomy 28. This is a really key passage in, in the story here. Um, here. Here's the deal. Here's what's going on at this point. Um, the people of God have been freed from slavery. Uh, they've wandered through the wilderness. Moses is, is about to pass, and he's giving his, his last words, and he's saying, here's how you are to live in the promised land. Here's the rules of engagement. Here's how to live in a life uh, where you love God and love one another. And, and so this is the first 14 verses. I'm not going to read those right now. I'm going to skip to the fun stuff, the curses. All right, so uh, this passage is often called the blessings and the curses. And then Moses basically says, but look, if you live against the grain of a God who's love, like if you live against the grain of a God who is for you and for each other, here's what's going to happen. If you choose idolatry and injustice, if you choose not to love God, reality, if you choose not to love each other, it's going to go really badly. Things will get dislocated. Things will hurt. Now, I don't have time to read it all, but let's listen to a portion of this judgment stuff. And I know this is heavy, but we need a way to process through all the heaviness that we are receiving from, from our news feeds. And, and we don't need to just check out and just like paste the plastic smile over and say, well, everything's going to be okay. We need to process the heaviness and rawness of this world with some of the heaviness and rawness that we see in Scripture, which will help heal us. So here's Deuteronomy 28. I'll start at verse 47. Listen to these words. I think you're going to find them rather familiar. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things. Therefore... You shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and in thirst, in nakedness and lacking everything. And, and he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young." Does that sound familiar? Okay, <clears throat> let's keep going. Verse 51. It, this nation, shall eat the offspring of your cattle and the fruit of your ground until you are destroyed. It also shall not leave you grain, wine, or oil, the increase of your herds or the young of your flock, until they have caused you to perish. They, they shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted Come down throughout all your land, and they shall besiege you in all your towns throughout all your land, which the Lord your God has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and in the distress with which your enemies shall distress you. Come on, that is brutal. That is brutal. And did you catch these hyperlinks here? The resonance with Lamentations 2. The nation from far away, what nation is that? That's Babylon, 
whose language you don't know, the, the, the Babel of Babylon, here they come. And it says, that nation shall eat the offspring of your cattle, the fruit of the ground, until you are destroyed. The destruction of the city of Jerusalem took two years. The, the Babylonians circled the city. They cut off all food supplies to starve the people to death to the point where cannibalism happened within the city walls, which is why it talks about it here and in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 20. All of this was, was warned against. The people were told this. Now, <clears throat> see how injustice and see how idolatry, not living in relation with reality, dissolves society to this, this point of just absolute um, brokenness and disintegration, where instead of caring for the young, they're, they're being devoured. Now, I want you to think through something here with me. So I have a, I have a question. How many years between God rescuing his people from slavery, the Exodus, and then telling them how to live this good life? How many years from uh, the Exodus to the exile, to the city of Jerusalem being destroyed and the people going off into exile? How many years do you think pass in between? 700 plus years almost three times as long as the United States has been a nation. 700 plus years of people trusting in terrible gods, of committing acts of injustice and abuse towards each other, of taking advantage of the vulnerable and the poor, of entering into war and trusting in weapons rather than trusting in a God of love and care. So what does this tell us? Well, a few things. God is merciful and patient. 700 years. This God is patient. He is just. And it is God's goodness. It is his justness, his faithfulness that sees to the destruction of Jerusalem. And that's a bizarre sounding statement. Because God is faithful, he destroys Jerusalem. He keeps his promise. He says, I will not allow wickedness to go on. God's anger, by the way, is never uneven. It's never unhinged like ours is. It all, it's always in relation to the injustice and the idolatry committed. And, and God gives warning and instruction time and time again, like, like a good parent who, who keeps telling their kid, don't jump off the chair that way or don't be leaning backwards because that parent knows what's going to happen. He keeps giving warning and instruction. <clears throat> and we see this uh, in Jeremiah. Right? So Jeremiah is is most likely the author of the book of Lamentations. And I want to read just another portion of Scripture because I want us to tie large swaths of Scripture together to see how this whole story plays out. Listen to this. Jeremiah 32, verses 28 and on. Here's Jeremiah telling the people what's going on. He says, Behold, the Lord, behold, I am giving this city into the hands of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, and into the hand of, the Neb of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he's going to conquer it. The Chaldeans who are fighting against the city shall come and set the city on fire, burn it with the houses on whose roofs offerings have been made to Baal, a terrible God who destroyed people. They're worshiping him in the city there. And then the drink offerings have been poured out to other gods. It's provoked me to anger. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. The children of Israel have done nothing but provoke me to anger by the works of their hands, how they act towards other people, the way they live their lives. This city has aroused my anger and wrath from the day it was built to this day so that I will remove it from my sight. Because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah that uh, they did to provoke me to anger... Their kings, their officials, their priests, and their prophets, and the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. It's everybody. They have turned to me their back and not their face. And though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. God, as a good parent, kept pleading with them, turn from the things that will devour you. And they turned their back on him. In short... God is extremely patient, 
extremely compassionate, merciful, and just. He was patient with those who refused him, but justice came in due time. And Lamentations teaches us this faithfulness. Verses 17, remember God has done what he said he would if his people would forsake him. So in other words, God's anger and his judgment are right. God is not okay with people living disconnected from reality and worshiping false gods that will devour them. God is not okay with injustice. God is not okay with sex trafficking. God is not okay with slavery. God is not okay with people trusting in power and trusting in violence and trusting in wealth and trusting in pleasure. He is not okay with exploiting the vulnerable. He is not okay with the killing of babies. He is not okay with selfish concern that turns a blind eye to the poor and marginalized. He is not okay with corrupt authorities, crooked politicians, or crooked priests. He's not okay with murder. He's not okay with bigotry. He is not okay with the perversity of racism. In his goodness, I want to emphasize that word, in his goodness, God will judge the evil of idolatry and the evil of injustice. And now I ask you something. I want you to go somewhere with me here for a moment. As we look out on our news feeds and as we look out at our city streets and we hear collective cries for justice, as we look around and see all of the, the anger right, that, that, that's bubbling up, whether righteous or whether unrighteous, how can we, with any consistency, with any intellectual integrity, Use the idea of a God who brings judgment as a reason not to trust him. How often it's heard, well, a loving God should be tolerant, right? Not that Old Testament God who's, who's judgmental. And see, here we run into a deep irrationality, this, this, this deep strain of insanity that, that permeates our world. A God of judgment who gets angry, like in the Old Testament, is, is said to be a God not worthy of our worship. He's not so tolerant, so he's not so loving, so he's not getting my worship, and we, we throw him away in that broken line of logic. Yet, hold that there, yet in our finitude right, and, and our frailty, we claim righteous anger on a daily basis and seek judgment for those that we feel are in the wrong and we cancel people in a moment because we judge them as unjust. We unleash verbal fury of, of our own wrath on those of some opposing political party or some uh, opposing stance and then we tout a tolerance, a tolerance as the summit moral virtue and yet we won't tolerate what we think is wrong. And here we are with short fuses and itchy trigger fingers, just hop on social media. So, okay, <laughs> what do we do as apprentices of Jesus in this crazy world? Well, one, we, we first make a move into lament, and we turn our anger, we hand our anger, and we hand our sorrow, when there's plenty of both, we hand them to God, and we walk the way of lament. Because one of the reasons why lament is so powerful, why lament is so profound, is lament is an expression of our desire for justice and for our need for mercy. Lament is simultaneously an expression of our desire for justice. God, how? And an expression of our need for mercy going, God, we need help. 
It's an act of faith that trusts God to be both just and merciful. And here's what happens when we have a desire for justice and an impulse for mercy, but we tackle those in a without God kind of way. We end up creating a system of oppressed and oppressor, and then the oppressed becomes the oppressor, and the oppressor then becomes the oppressed, and on and on the cycle goes because we can't meet out the mercy and the true justice that needs to be meted out on our own human strength. And so we tear the world apart seeking justice and mercy when we seek them without God. Now, <clears throat> that said, uh, God is right in his mercy. God is right in his judgments. And, and some of us now need to hear this. Just because God is right in his judgments doesn't mean we shouldn't grieve when there's difficulty in this world or grieve his right judgments. And some, some of us need permission to grieve because we have this script in our head that says, well, God's sovereign, God's good, he's gonna do whatever he wants, so it's just the way of the world, so what does it matter? Like, I'm not gonna grieve. No, we, we need to lament. And I'll say it this way, just because God is right in all that he does, and even though we may be given a why for what has happened, like with Jerusalem in the book of Lamentations, it does not mean we don't need to work through the grief and walk the way of lament. We need to process. We need to walk through it. And if we don't process it in a healthy way by taking that anger and sorrow to God, we're going to process it in an unhealthy way. And we're going to beat other people up with it. Lament dignifies human suffering. And it honors God as both just and merciful. And so when we don't engage in it, God is not honored. And our suffering, honestly, isn't honored. It just rages all the more. So lament helps us to process grief, to process anger. And, and here's the key. It helps us to process grief and anger in the place where justice and mercy truly meet. Lament takes us to the place where mercy ministers to our soul and true justice is actualized and it's not a hypothetical uh, floaty ideal. And that place where justice and mercy meet is the cross of Jesus Christ. Listen to these words from the Apostle Paul, who himself, come on, who himself committed acts of injustice, acts of violence against the innocent. Yet he drank deeply from the wells of the mercy that Christ has provided. Listen to his words in Romans chapter 5, 6 through 11, and let the gospel heal you where you sit. He says this, he says, for while we, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He doesn't pit the world into two camps, like, not for, he didn't die for us, he died for them. We, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We've been reconciled to God, and now we are reconciled to each other. And so as, as apprentices of Jesus, as people who are drawn into the sufferings of Jesus, we can be real about the raw pain, the terror, the atrocities, the injustices that we see and we commit. There's no pretending, 
you know, we don't have to put on a fake smile about the stuff that's going on and, 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 and jump too quickly to some kind of silver lining. We don't have to wear a plastic Christian face, face in order to be a, a true believer. We can enter into that place of sorrow. We can enter into that place of confession and then we can rise with hope knowing that he has given us mercy. He has saved the sinner. He has punished the sin. On the cross, Jesus took and absorbed our, our due suffering, our agony and punishment. And, and in lament, catch this, in, in lament, we offer our suffering and our agony and pain to God that he would somehow absorb it. Lament is cross-shaped. And when you enter into lament, you enter into a Christ-like way of seeing healing happen. And because of Jesus, justice is not a pipe dream or some naive ideal. He will judge the world perfectly, righting every wrong, wiping every tear. My friends, biblical lament always lifts our eyes to the cross of Jesus Christ. For there, in the suffering and death of Jesus, divine justice and mercy come to humanity. I'll wrap up with this. In lament, in lament, we enter into the sufferings of Jesus Christ that we might know the glory of Jesus. We cannot be fully conformed to the image of this Jesus unless we learn to walk the way of lament. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> well, one, I, just, I ask for your grace that though this is a, a heavy sermon with, with some rough words in a, a rough and heavy time, that what we leave with is actually a sense of grace. That this Christian faith deals with the muddle. It deals with the mess. God, it deals with our grief. And it doesn't call us to check our tears at the door and pretend that things aren't the way they are. It acknowledges reality. And then it offers a true hope. A way forward that we can then enter back into the world. Yes, with, with wounds and scars, but with joy, knowing that one day you will wipe every tear. And God, we need that hope right now as a church family, as a nation, as a world whose bones are groaning. So Lord Jesus, uh, would you be honored and glorified? Would we walk out of here today, would all my brothers and sisters in their homes, wherever they are, enter into the rest of their day with, with the buoyancy of grace and hope, lifting them up? We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for all that you've done, all that you continue to do through your church by the power of your spirit, and all that you will do to make all things right. It is in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship through song. Christ, we have all we need. 
In Christ we have all we need Let's confess this today In Christ we have Inside the work, my hope is found within the work of Jesus Christ. My hope is found within the work of Jesus Christ. In Christ, we have all we need. Christ we
thank you, Jesus. He has given us life. And we are changed. Restored and made new. He has given us life. He has given us life. Church, we are family, which makes um, this moment right now so sweet and challenging for, for us. At this point, I want to call up some dear friends of mine, uh, the Lindstrom family. Come on up, guys. <clears throat> you guys can just kind of stand, stand right here so everyone at home can can see you all. Um, if you do not know um, uh, our good friends here, this is Jason and Tara and, and Zoe and, and Zach, and they have been a member. They have been members of this church family for years now. Uh, how many years has it been? Nine years. Nine years. And um, man, they have served in so many capacities. It's just crazy. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to get through this without crying, so you're just going to have to put up with me. <clears throat> um, from um, family ministries to helping us throw our spring barbecues to volunteering at just countless events to deacons to benevolence to um, Jason, you're just uh, heading off the elder board and Tara leading the charge at Inkling so faithfully through all our ups and downs, our challenges and good times, and you guys in our ministry here. Um, it's just been a part of this family for a long time. And uh, um, I, they'll, they'll be moving to the, the East Coast here. Um, where specifically? What town? Outside of Raleigh. Out, just right outside of Raleigh, uh, which is a few miles away from here. Um, uh, but on behalf of the church family, I just want to say um, you're loved. And um, I can't imagine this church family without you. And thankfully, I don't have to imagine the larger church family without you uh, because we're still brothers and, and sisters I want to thank you for your years of uh, service and um, just sticking with it and being faithful, even when it was not easy, even when it was painful, and it, it came at a great cost to you. So thank you for showing me um, Christ, and it is a great honor um, to know you all and to send you off uh, with a blessing on behalf of the church family. Um, so wherever uh, you are, um, I, I pray that you would um, join us now as we bless the Lindstroms, um, as God takes them further up and further into uh, their next um, season of faithfulness. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we call you Father knowing that um, you've made us your kids. And so here um, before me and everyone else are our brothers and sisters. Um, and I thank you for their years of faithfulness, for the way you have grown them, for the way your grace has been in operation in their life at such a huge level and down to the details of how they conduct their, their daily work and how they raise their kids. 
And I thank you for the joy of getting to see their kids grow in the faith and exhibit Christ-likeness. Father, I have so much to thank you for with the Lindstroms. Um, but at this point, let's, let's think forward into what you have for them. I ask that you would bless them in this move as they, they seek new ways to be faithful to you as they they get connected to uh, the community there would you bless them would your face shine upon them would you show them new greater glories of knowing christ as savior and would the world around them smell the fragrance of christ because of the sacrificial way that they live So, Lord, would you be honored in all that they say, they do, and think. To you be the glory in their life and their further travels. We love you, Lord. We commend them now to you um, in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. And to all of you, uh, we love you and cannot wait to be with you. Go in peace. God bless.